Hello. Uh, am I properly positioned? And so we're in a frame because uh, we are on Zoom. So welcome everyone who is joining us live uh, in uh, Weiser Hall on the fifth floor in the University of Michigan campus, um, uh, as well as those of you joining us over Zoom. Uh, those of you who are joining us over Zoom, please be aware that we invite you to participate fully in the conversation after the talk. Simply put your question in the Q&A um, on the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will get those questions, sometimes combined with other questions for the sake of efficiency, and then, and then relay them on your behalf to our speaker. Welcome, everyone. My name is Benjamin Paloff. I am the director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies here at the University of Michigan. Um, and it is a tremendous pleasure to welcome uh, Alice Lovejoy, Associate Professor of Cultural Studies and Comparative Literature at the University of Minnesota. I've been looking forward to this talk for, I don't know, when I mentioned, when I mentioned inviting Alice, it was probably like two years ago already, um, when we were just trying to find the right time and uh, the right circumstances for her visit, hoping that she would be able to visit us in person as she's doing. Now, um, I want to be sure to thank the Department of Film, Television, and Media for co-sponsoring this event, uh, offering both publicity and funding. Um, and I need to announce a couple of upcoming events before I introduce our speaker. So upcoming events uh, here at the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies include actually an ongoing event is uh, a, an exhibit that's literally next door to us right now. Uh, entitled Survivors, Saving Survivors, Photographing the Ukrainian Refugee Experience in Poland, sponsored by the uh, Copernicus Center for Polish Studies, Greece, that's us, the Frankel Center for Judaic Studies as well, and it's in the International Institute Gallery uh, through April 28th. These are photographs done by uh, photographer Chuck Fishman um, in and around the Jewish Community Center in Krakow, which is one of it, uh, the main point of refugee refugee relief work being done for Ukrainian refugees fleeing into southern Poland. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic exhibit. I hope you'll have a chance to see it. Also, uh, so that's through the 28th of April. Uh, on April 17th, that's Monday from 12 to 2 p.m., the, we will have the Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia Symposium uh, called Ukrainian Scholars at Risk discuss their research. The um, description kind of says it all, but it, it, uh, it more or less consists of our current fellows who are uh, scholars, faculty from Ukrainian institutions uh, forced to flee. Uh, many of them are still conducting classes online with their students who are scattered around the world. Uh, and they have been in residence at the University of Michigan for this last year, and they will be presenting on their uh, research on the name of all of them the presenters in their fields, but it will be uh, quite a rich um, discussion. So to the main event, um, Alice Lovejoy is a media and cultural historian and comparatist whose research examines governmental and institutional media and transnational perspective. Um, because it's not in my notes, I wanna make sure to mention that up front, her current project involves, uh, is an investigation on the uh, involvement of the Kodak Film Corporation in the Manhattan Project, a, a beautiful intersection of film and violence. Um, so uh, I mentioned that now so that it can percolate in your mind so you can ask her about it afterwards because I want to hear more about that too. Uh, her first book, Army Film and the Avant-Garde Cinema and Experiment in the Czechoslovak Military, which was published by Indiana University Press in 2015, with the main co-winner of the Modern Language Association's 2018 Aldo and Jean Scaglione Prize for Studies in Slavic Languages and Literatures. Here, one more aside, um, I was on the jury for that prize, as I've been on many different juries in our field. Uh, for the last several years, it's a form of professional service that I highly recommend people engage in for all kinds of reasons, not least of which is it affords you uh, a rather exceptional overview of everything being published in the field, in a broad spectrum of the field, 
in that last year. And I've been doing this sort of thing for almost, I think almost 10 years now for different organizations. And I can tell you that this particular book, Army Film and the Avant-Garde is one of the, my favorite books published in our field in the last 10 years. I think it's an amazing book. It also comes with a DVD that gives you visual uh, documentation of the uh, material that's discussed in that collect in that uh, in that study. With Marie uh, Mari Kayala, she co-edited Remapping Cold War Media Institutions, Infrastructures, Translations, which came out from Indiana University Press just this past year. And she's published widely on East European, uh, particularly Czech and Slovak film and literature. Uh, she has worked as a film critic, a curator, a filmmaker. Um, including as editor at Film Comment Magazine. And her research has been supported by, among others, an American Council of Learned Society's postdoctoral fellowship, a Fulbright Hayes fellowship, uh, two Fulbright fellowships, and the University of Minnesota's McKnight Land Grant uh, Professorship and Health Faculty Research Award. Her talk today, again titled uh, Media for the Modern Child studying children and cinema during the Cold War, will consider an enduring question in media theory and practice. How have adult imaginings of childhood perception shaped the moving image, uh, its aesthetics, its thought, and its culture? Um, I won't belabor the introduction because you're going to give us the talk. So uh, I'm just so excited to hear this talk. Thank you all for coming and please join me in welcoming Alice Lovejoy. I'll turn my mic on just a second. All right, so that should be working better. Um, Benjamin, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Um, and thank you all for being here. It's really an honor to be with you um, in person and virtually. Um, and I also especially want to thank Liz and the Crease staff for all of the organizational work um, related to my visit. It's really lovely to be in Ann Arbor again. So um, Benjamin has mentioned, this is new work. Um, this is part of a book project um, that I'm working on, on the institutions, the aesthetics, and the politics of children's film and media during the Cold War. Um, this is a project that's not only based in Eastern Europe, but it moves between Eastern Europe, Iran, and the Francophone world, um, which are all spaces that are very well known um, for their work in children's film. Um, and at its core is the question that Benjamin just mentioned, which is um, this question that I think comes up again in film and media theory, film media practice in various places, which is how is children's perception, or more precisely, how have adult imaginings of how children see, how children perceive the world, how has this shaped moving image aesthetics, theory, and institutions? So I'm going to be thinking today through two intertwined reflections of this question in post-war film and media culture. Now, the first is the longstanding fear of media influence. Um, that is the anxiety about the moving image's impact on child psychology and behavior that as early film history has shown um, very well, has long been a structuring force in cinema culture. So um, helping shape uh, movie theater design, helping shape programming choices, um, narrative form in film, et cetera. The second is the idea that children's vision can serve as a formal template for media. And this is the idea of the innocent eye articulated by John Ruskin in his 1857 Elements of Drawing and famously adopted as a model for experimental film by Stan Brakhage um, in this probably familiar quote from his 1963 Metaphors on Vision. Imagine an eye unruled by man-made laws of perspective, an eye unprejudiced by compositional logic, an eye which does not respond to the name of everything, but which must know each object encountered in life through an adventure of perception. How many colors are there in a field of grass to the crawling baby unaware of green? How many rainbows can light create for the untutored eye? Um, and this, you know, the last two uh, lines there that are really crucial in brackets, of course, is a you know, seminal um, avant-garde filmmaker in the United States um, in the post-war period. Now, as film scholars Lee Grieveson, Anna Olenina, and others have shown, in the interwar years, these encounters between children and the moving image became a focus of social scientific research. From Belgian psychologist Maurice Rouvois, Center for the Study of Children in Cinema, 
So the pain fund studies attempts to measure precisely how moving images affected um, American children. There was a sense that disciplines such as psychology and sociology could explain what happened to children when they encountered a film. But after World War II, social scientific research on children and media took on different dimensions, in part because of the rapid growth of media production for children. Um, so it was at this point, for instance, that as Heather Hendershot has shown, um, cognitive research began to lay the formal and narrative groundwork for the children's television program, Sesame Street. And it's this post-war nexus between research and production that I'll be discussing through the work of a series of institutions who were founded to study children's relationship to the moving image, and in many cases also to produce media for young audiences. And um, these include Iran's Institute for the Intellectual Development of Children and Young Adults, the Film and Child Commission um, in Yugoslavia, the Institute of Filmology in France, and the International Center of Films um, for Children and Young People, which was a UNESCO affiliate organization that was founded in Brussels in 1955 and really coordinated the activities um, of these national institutions. Um, this is just a few of the ones that I look at in this project, um, and I can talk more about some of the others um, later. So what I'll be doing in this talk is tracing the points of contact between these institutions, and in the process, asking what research on children and media meant both for the post-war field of film and media study, as it was developing and changing in those years, and for the questions of film form that Brackage and others have raised. So these institutions' histories all follow a similar outline. Um, they were founded in the quarter century after World War II, which was, again, a moment when government-sponsored research on and media production for children expanded rapidly. Now, this built, um, on one hand, on the wartime proliferation of educational and informational film. Um, it also built on documentaries crystallization as a largely didactic mode, which happened around the 1930s. And eventually, it dovetailed with the rise of television um, after the war. But it was also rooted in the heightened symbolism surrounding youth in this period. As the war orphans emerging from the rubble in Gezara Vanyi's 1947 film, Somewhere in Europe, suggest, children embodied the promise of post-war renewal. Yet, Somewhere in Europe's counterpart, Roberto Rossellini's Germany Year Zero, illustrates the inverse of this optimism. Um, and this is the widespread anxiety about what Roxanne Amery terms, quote, unemployed, unhappy, dangerous youth tested by the horrors of war, and plunged into a chaotic and violent world in which the threat of a new world war already looms." end quote. So this brings me to this talk's first site, which is France, um, where, as Amery and others have described, anxiety about post-war youth um, and the fear that cinema might foster what was thought of as delinquency um, helped shape the new, uh, the so-called new academic discipline of filmology, which was founded in Paris in 1947 with a journal bearing its name, um, and the Institute of Filmology was founded later um, in 1950. Filmology's founder, Gilbert cohen explicitly conceived it as interdisciplinary. It brought together technical, aesthetic, and philosophical studies of cinema with research in psychology, experimental physiology, anthropology, and sociology. And from its beginnings through the mid-1950s, filmology was heavily invested in the empirical study of film's effects on the viewer. Now, there have been um, a series of recent excellent reevaluations of filmology. So for the purpose of this talk, I want to note simply that children were the subject of a considerable amount of the Institute's research. This was due both to concerns about um, cinema and delinquency, right, the concerns I've just mentioned, and to the presence of prominent child psychologists among the field's researchers, um, such as Henri Vallon, who's here, um, with his student um, Bianca Zazo. And uh, Bianca Zazo and her husband Rene Zazo were both prominent researchers in the Institute. And Bianca Zazo was um, a Polish immigrant, in fact. Yet this focus on children also had to do with filmology's interest in scientifically analyzing and generalizing film's effects both on the individual and on society. In his 1949 essay, The Child in Film, Vallon explains why children were such a compelling subject for this sort of investigation. And this was because their developmental stages were relatively well understood, so that, for instance, a given film's effects on a preschool child could easily be compared with its effects on an elementary school child, etc. 
Now, some of this research um, was, again, psychophysiological in nature, using EEGs um, to track children's reactions to films. And much of it involved psychological testing, so um, interviews, questionnaires, etc. And to give an example of this, in one study, which you can see here, uh, Bianca Zazo asked children to watch a film sequence and then recount its plot. Uh, and sociological research in filmology, such as Edgar Morin's um, well-known essay, The Problem of Cinema's Dangerous Effects, put statistical data on film going into dialogue with factors such as social class, gender, age, and climate. And here I'll start to move beyond France. For filmology had a considerable influence on film study as it took shape in the early post-war period, especially in Europe. This was the case not only in the countries where the field's conferences were held, places like Belgium, Italy, and the UK, but also on the other side of the so-called Iron Curtain. Moran's sociological approaches, for instance, were a touchpoint for the audience studies that Przemysl Meidel and Innocent Arnoz Blaha carried out at the Czechoslovak Film Institute between 1947 and 1950. Um, and although social scientific research diminished significantly during Czechoslovakia's Stalinist period, Filmological articles and books were cited elsewhere in the region as early as the mid-1950s, especially in studies of children and media, such as Polish scholar Janina Koblewska Rublova's book, um, this is uh, The Child in Fil Film and the Child from 1961, and those of Yugoslav scholar Miroslav Brabets, whose 1977 book, Film Introduction to Film and Television Art, which he co-wrote with the linguist Stepko Tejak, List translated books by Cohen Sea and Morin, among others, in its bibliography. But there was a key difference between these works and the work that Meidel and Blaha were conducting in Prague. While all five scholars were working within the field of media studies as it was developing in these years, the primary context for Koblevska Rublova's and Vrabets's work was pedagogical. Vrabets, for instance, was a professor of pedagogy at Banja Luka. And this is important, for in the field of pedagogy in Eastern Europe and beyond, filmological research was used to make a very different argument about the child than the arguments that were made by psychologists such as Vallon or the Zazos. And Améry again summarizes this in the following way. For the psychologists, the child was a subject essentially determined by biopsychological givens that corresponded to each age category and were modulated by cinema's effects. On the contrary, for the pedagogues, the child was a singular subject formed by a network of evolving interpersonal relations and a sum of progressively acquired experiences, one of which was cinema. So we can see this pedagogical idea of the child, as well as its links to filmology in Brabitz's film and television art, right, the book on um, the right here, which although it's designed as a guidebook for educators interested in teaching film in schools, right, using it in classrooms, also makes a substantial theoretical argument about children's identification with cinema. To summarize this, um, Rabetz argues that children play an active role in the process of identification, right, identifying with what they see on screen. Uh, for instance, a child might identify both with a so-called positive and with a so-called negative character in a film, um, but in Roberts's view, this isn't a problem. It's not dangerous since both kinds of identification brought in the child's, quote, knowledge of the diversity of human experience, their cognitive horizons, and their understanding of what he terms ethical norms and principles. Now, unsurprisingly, given the presence of Morin's cinema or the imaginary man in his bibliography, Roberts is drawing on Morin's theory of spectator participation. I'm going to show you. Um, Morin's book here, that's Cinema or the Imaginary Man, that is its um, translation. Um, and participation, as Morin lays it out, is the idea that the viewer identifies polymorphously, in his words, with a film, um, with all of its characters and with the entire array of cinematic techniques and devices. But I want to focus um, today less on this theoretical link than on the way that it was made, which was not only through translation, right? So you can see the translation of um, his book, uh, Made in Belgrade in 1967 here, but also through personal connections that were fostered by the ICFCYP, this UNESCO organization, in which um, Morin and Robert were both active participants. 
1967, for instance, the same year that this translation was published, Morat published, uh, excuse me, presented at an ICF CYP symposium in Czechoslovakia on the hero in children's films, um, a symposium at which Rabetz was likely also present. So in this sense, Rabetz's book underscores one of the points that I want to make today. Um, and this is that if children's relationship to the moving image remains an impetus for cinema and media study in the post-war years, just as it had been before the war, pedagogical institutions were also an important space for the development and dissemination of film and media theory. Theory that had to do with much more than just children, right? And much more with the question of what to do in a, a classroom context or a school context. But differently, film and media theory was not only the province of, say, academic conferences or journals or film criticism or film festivals, but what we might think of as the discipline's primary institutions. But it also flourished in seemingly tangential venues, such as pedagogy conferences and teaching handbooks. But I say seemingly tangential because the figures who were involved with these institutions were by no means marginal to cinema culture. Among Rabitz's colleagues on the Film and Child Commission were Vlada Petrich, you can see here on the left of the screen, who would go on to found the Harvard Film Archive. This is a very nice image of sort of the Eastern European um, exiles in, in the US in post-war experimental film culture with um, Jonas Mikas. And another was filmmaker Dushan Makaveyev, who you see um, in the center there during the production of WR. Um, and Makaveyev, in fact, published extensively on the psychological dimensions of youth film in the 50s and 60s, and even made one, at least one film for the commission, which was the 1964 Nova Igrachka, or New Toy. Um, and so Makaveyev, for those who don't know, was also trained as a psychologist. He was trained as a Gestalt psychologist. So the involvement of filmmakers like Makaveyev in this work underscores a second point. And this is that institutions like the Film and Child Commission did not only conduct research on children and media, they were also invested in pragmatic questions, right? What kind of films should be shown to children? Where should they be shown? Should they be shown at film festivals, in schools, in um, specially equipped train cars, et cetera? Um, and what should they look like? Right. And so with this, I'm going to move to East Berlin, where in 1968, the ICF CYP sponsored a colloquium on popular scientific filmmaking for children, where these links between research uh, and form were discussed with particular energy. Um, and this is a colloquium that was organized by the GDR's National Center for Children's Film, and you can see their logo here. Now, the colloquium opened with a simple question. Uh, in the words of Soviet scholar Professor Dolin, how to talk to children about science. Um, and I'm giving you just his last name because the transcript that I have of this event only has last names. So you'll hear a lot of professors and doctors and what follows. But the simple quickly became complex for as Dolin noted, talking to children about science required, quote, a search for the form, the use and the whole scope of filmic art, end quote. And this was because in his words, basic conceptual questions about film are forced upon us by the psyche and the sphere of interest of the young audience." End quote. Now, the child's psyche um, was uh, at the heart of an anxiety that was palpable throughout this colloquium um, in East Berlin. And this was different from the anxiety that had motivated interwar studies of media influence. As the Hungarian representative, Dr. Zemesh, put it early in the colloquium, it was a challenge to find a pedagogical slash aesthetic form that would meet the needs of contemporary youth, who in her words, possess a much more advanced film culture than the generations before them. And this is because they had not only been steeped in cinema, but also in television, right? So this is, this is around 68, television is very much, um, very much on the scene um, in terms of media culture at this point. Now, an initial solution to this challenge was on one hand, research. Dr. Koleva from Bulgaria, for instance, argued that prior to marking on a film, one should, quote, find out the needs and inclinations of young spectators using tools like questionnaires. But as the colloquium proceeded, it became clear that these uh, strategies, these methods only confirmed the impression that contemporary children were advanced. Dr. Koleva, again, uh, discussed a survey she had conducted for a film about music education reporting that whereas 90% of the adults made the standard decision for classical music, the children gave very interesting and varied answers. 
For example, a seven-year-old child said he liked modern music very much, and that, quote, I don't like opera music at all. I think it looks very ugly when the leading actor or opera singer opens his mouth so wide that he looks exactly like a hungry lion. Now, there was another quote in her report that talked about how adults really don't understand the Beatles question. So it, it's very, you know, very much a, a report of its time. Yeah. In his report of the colloquium, Miroslav Vrabets, again in Yugoslavia, summarized these observations. He noted a, quote, stronger and stronger overcoming of the barriers between the child and the world of grown-ups that was symptomatic of the present time, again, around 68, concluding that modern children have new demands and show new aspects of their artistic sensibility. We should not react to these demands and this sensibility with flimsy moral and infantile lessons, but rather with films offering new content closely connected to life in a new filmic adaptation. And so the colloquium's opening question went unanswered, right? There was no clear way to talk to children about science through film, since children displayed no obvious formal affinities other than for the modern. Moreover, they were advanced and sophisticated, confounding both the age categories and the research methods that might typically have been used to discover things about, say, taste. The only possible way to proceed, Alash Bozak of the Czechoslovak Children's Film Studio suggested, was to do away with aesthetic formulas altogether. And so, given all of this, right, this sort of research infrastructure around children's film in this period, what kinds of films did figures like Brabets consider appropriate to teach in schools? Now, some of these are mentioned in the introduction to film and television art, um, which includes a series of lesson plans. Its animation section, for instance, uh, lists a surprising, oh, that's the book <laughs> in which you find the lesson plans. Uh, it's, so its animation section lists a surprising set of films, including the Hand, Aruka by Yuji Tunka, the Czech animator, um, an allegory for authoritarianism that was suggested to be taught to children in eighth grade and above. Um, he also offers a questionnaire that could be given to school children after a screening of Croatian animator Dusan Bukovic's 1961 film, The Substitutes. Um, and these are things like The Substitute, um, I, do, I do not like it, I like it a bit, I like it, I like it very much, etc. So as I mentioned, questionnaires like these were a mainstay of psychological and sociological research on children and cinema. But in his book, Vrabets also mentions another method that was used widely in pedagogical approaches to this field. And this is observing children watching films, photographing and documenting the reactions, their physical positioning and the like. Um, this kind of observation was likely rooted in the child study movement, right, dating from the 19th century. And you can see an example of it um, in this page from British scholar Mary Field's 1954 book, Children and Films, A Study of Boys and Girls in the Cinema. Um, and you can see the numbers that Field has put, you know, on, on the children and, and what these are meant to do, um, because this is a book with sociological leanings, is to consider the children's reactions vis-a-vis -vis social class, right? So each of these numbers is accompanied by a listing of their parents' professions, where they live, et cetera. So the kinds of images that you see here, however, were also a trope in films of this time. In Latvian director Gerd Franks, 1978, 10 Minutes Older, a wonderful film, or famously in Francois Truffaut's 1959, 400 Blows, the story of teenage so called delinquent Antoine Duanel that might be seen as a response to the research that was happening at the Institute of Thelmology elsewhere in Paris at the same time. But observational methods like these were also taken up in a particular way, different way, in another film by Dushan Vukotic. Um, who directed Substitute, which you just saw still from. And this is the 1962 film Igra, um, or play. And I'm gonna spend some time with play because it can help us approach the question of what film form for a so-called modern child might look like. Um, and so I'm gonna start with a clip from the film's beginning.
Okay, so at first glance, when we first enter the scene, play seems to have a great deal in common with the kinds of research that I've been discussing in this talk. Uh, the mise-en-scene suggests that it is a study film, right? The tools of the experiment are visible in the frame. The walls are a neutral color. Um, everything is sort of carefully laid out. And the subjects, um, a girl and a boy around four or five years old, perhaps, are clearly identifiable, identifiable as the subjects of the research. Um, and again, age was a crucial factor in all of these studies of children and cinema um, in this period. The research question itself seems to be posed in the film's title, what is children's play? But this title is ambiguous. The word igra can refer to children's play, but it can just as well refer to a game. And indeed, when the children appear for the first time, it's clear that this ostensible documentation of children's play, in fact, depicts a quite peculiar game, with neither the children's drawings nor the children themselves behaving the way we might expect them to, right, given the setup here. Um, and you'll have noted, of course, that the soundtrack is really that of a horror film, right? Uh, this is obvious by the end of the film, and I'm just going to show you a, a very short clip of the last, uh, the last minute or so. Of the film. Okay, so you can see how um, how this ends in a very different note than than in the way it begins. And what happens is that you know they begin by fighting with a car running over the flower, and it escalates to war with weapons and then nuclear weapons, etc. And that's that's the end of the film. So this ending um, with uh, which you've seen just here has clear echoes of Norman McLaren's 1952 film Neighbors, um, and this reminds us that this is a film of the time and a film of the Cold War. McLaren's film also uses pixelation, which is the strategy of animating human figures that you see at the very beginning of the first clip of play. Um, and it also begins with a conflict over a flower that you see here, and it transforms into an allegory for nuclear war, from a sort of a game that is to something that's deadly serious. Um, and you can see sort of how things progress um, in this film by the, the bottom frame, right? So from the beginning to the middle to two graves at the end. And Vukatic's reference was likely deliberate, um, since he and McLaren worked in the same circles, right? They were both part of the kind of highest echelons of animation at the time. But the similarities between these two films also underscore what's obvious when one watches play, which is that these modern children seem very adult at times, right? Though they're young, they are sophisticated both artistically, they know how to make pictures move, um, and socially, right? They're disconcertingly violent, playing both cat and mouse games and war games, Again, um, going back to the film's title, right? Igra, I think this ambiguous meaning. And this violence appears to unfold progressively through the acts of drawing. Now, by the time that Vukatic made play, 
children's drawings were an established topic of interest to psychologists. Uh, perhaps most famously in um, Michigan's own Rudolf Arnheim's 1954 Art and Visual Perception, which is a work that aimed to, quote, cast the visual process in psychological terms. Now, children's drawings um, appear throughout Arnheim's book, especially in a chapter entitled Growth, which considers uh, children's art in a developmental light as prefiguring, quote, the fundamental features that operate in a refined, complicated, and modified ways in mature arts. In their drawings, Arnheim argues, children progress through stages of increasing complexity, all underpinned by an awareness of drawing as a process of representation. Now, Art and Visual Perception, again by Arnheim, wouldn't be published in Yugoslavia until 1971. Um, although Arnheim's film as art appeared in Serbian translation with a preface, um, in fact, by Vlada Petrich, in 1962, the same year that play was released. But nevertheless, the book suggests some ways to interpret play. For example, Arnheim's discussion of the quote, representational aspect of motor behavior, the gestures a child makes while drawing, um, in many ways explains the logic of the film's animation. In describing a four-year-old's picture of a man mowing a lawn, which you can see um, at the top of the frame, Arnheim writes that, quote, the mower is depicted by a whirl not only because the rotating lines render the characteristic motion of the machine visually, but also because the child's arm reenacted the motion as a gesture during the drawing. Um, and in play, it is just to take one example, the boy's hand motions and engine noises that set his car into motion, right? So there's a way in which in this film, the children and the drawings are impossible to separate from each other. They're one and the same. But I wanna pause on this idea of representation Responding to the commonplace that children simply draw what they see, Arnheim argues that children are aware not just of what a given picture depicts, but also of the picture's purpose and that they develop representational strategies accordingly. Um, he gives the example of color and I'll read this quote. The color the child gives to the trees in his pictures is hardly a specific shade of green selected from the hundreds of hues to be found in trees. It's a color that matches the overall impression given by trees. We are dealing not with an imitation, but with an invention, the discovery of an equivalent that represents the relevant features of the model with the resources of a particular medium, right? In this case, crayons or colored pencils. So this not only suggests a way of reading the children in play as, to borrow Robbins's words from East Berlin, advanced in their artistic sensibility, it also offers a starkly different interpretation of the color green than the Brackage quote with which I began. Like Brackage's hypothetical child, Arnheim's child sees hundreds of hues in trees as in grass, but instead of straightforwardly reproducing this variation, the child strategically chooses a single color, which becomes not a marker not of innocence, in Brackage's phrasing, but of the child's discernment, its awareness of its own agency in the process of representation. So in this sense, the modern or advanced children in play are not just the product of their media environments, um, as was speculated in East Berlin. More fundamentally, they are the products of developments. But play also suggests a different answer to the question of um, what aesthetics were appropriate for such a modern child. For here, it is from the child's very status as a research subject that a new cinematic form emerges. So this idea um, of a link between novel formal strategies in cinema and social scientific research on children brings me to the final space that I'll discuss today, Iran, um, and to Abbas Kiarostami's 1988 film, Homework, um, which is the last film that he made for Kanun, whose film section um, he helped found. Um, and here I want to acknowledge the really extraordinary contributions that um, Michigan's Nilo Parsarlati made to this project, um, both through research in Iran and through many wonderful discussions in the Twin Cities. Now, unlike the other institutions this talk um, has discussed, Kanun came to cinema via literature. The Institute was founded in 1965 at the behest of Empress Farah Pahlavi, who was involved in children's issues and especially in literacy, um, which was a cornerstone of the Shah's 1963 White Revolution, um, which was the so-called modernization campaign that was intended to shore up support for the Pahlavi family. Kanun began by founding libraries and it came to oversee a range of cultural activities for children. It produced and continues to produce children's music, books, film, theater, and other media, 
It taught and it teaches children to make them, and it collects and archives domestic and foreign works, um, in part in cinema um, through the um, its children's film festival, the International Children's Film Festival, which became a site in the 60s for acquiring films. Um, from its very earliest years, Kanun was involved with the transnational institutional networks that I've been discussing around children's media, and it had particularly close connections to Eastern Europe, um, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and elsewhere. Um, by summer 1967, the Institute was a member of the UNESCO organization, the ICF-CYP, and today it is the headquarters um, of, of this organization. So while the cinema world knows Kanun, mostly for directors like Kiristami, right, it's very, very well known, um, research was a foundational element of the Institute's work with its cultural and social research center investigating children's lives and culture as they intersected with themes such as, um, just to take one year, education and development, media, religious sociology, sociology of tradition and cultural modernism, art and literature, alienation, leisure issues, bureaucracy and cultural planning, right? So this is what all of, some of the kinds of topics that the research um, wing of the organization is conducting. And Kanun's focus on both research on children and media and media production for children allows us once again to examine the links between these two poles, which are visible in an especially complex way in homework, um, which is a nonfiction feature that's composed primarily of a series of interviews about homework with um, second graders um, that are conducted by Kurosami himself. In Kurosami's words, homework is, quote, not a film in a typical sense. It is research, pictorial research on children's homework. Um, and Hamid Nafisi notes, just to give some background on this, that the film builds on 800 surveys about homework um, that Kiristami and his team sent to school children, about two dozen of whom were chosen for the film. So I'm gonna start with a clip uh, from this film, and this is subtitled. Too much, now too much. Hello? Mommy, you know too much, I said, I'm in a bad way. چجوری؟ <laughs> یعنی مادرت بهت کارهای دیگه میگه بکنی یا نه؟ دیکته میرستم، فرسه میکنم نه، منظورم کار خونه است کار خونه؟ کار خونه ندارم چه؟ نمیدونی چیه؟ اصلا میری نون بخری هیچ و؟ نه، هر وقت نون دارم تموم بشه میرم هر وقت تموم بشه، وقت تموم نشده نمیری بخری چیز دیگه چی؟ میره بخری؟ می... میره آره میره خب، تو وقتی مشقاتو خوب نمیلویسی، تنبیهت میکنن یا نه؟ مشقاتو چی؟ خانم تو مدرسه چی؟ تو خونه چی؟ پدر مادر چی؟ پدر مادر میزن چه جوری میزنه؟ نمیشه یعنی میشه آدم کتایی بخوره بعد نداره چی جوری کتایی خورده؟ اونا از کجا میفهمن که تو مشق تو بعد نوشتی؟ و چون که سواد ندارن که؟ میدونم سواد نداره آخو میدونم من در که من بارم کنم یا میشون نشون میدارم میگه بعد یه بده؟ که سواد نداره از کجا میدونه که بعدی؟ I'm gonna stop there um, So again remember that this was founded on the basis of a series of surveys and when you see the film at first glance it does appear to be an audiovisual survey The mise en scène is unchanging the boys are all, at least to start with, asked essentially the same questions. 
And we see little other than the boys um, outside of occasional reverse shots of the cameraman and um, more rarely of Kiristami himself who's posing the questions, right? So think of a survey, survey is meant to focus on the subject who's answering it. This can be kind of an audiovisual answer to that. As the film progresses, the interviews bleed into one another. At times, as I think you've seen in this clip, the answer to a question asked of one boy is answered by a second, with the very seriality of these interviews underscoring not only the school system's bureaucratic nature, but also deeper structural problems. For as, again, the film goes on, the boys' responses steer us ever more clearly into a meditation on poverty, inadequate social resources, parenting, and especially punishment. Yet if homework can be read as a critique of social or institutional authoritarianism, it can also be read as a critique of the methods that the film employs to reveal this authoritarianism. Indeed, and characteristically, Kiristami pushes the conventions of social scientific filmmaking to their limits, to the point of artifice, with the shadowy close-ups of the cameraman that you've seen, and in his own depiction of a detached sunglasses-wearing researcher. And this is, again, despite the fact that the children of the film, film are very real and at times afraid. This is clearest um, in the film's final sequence, and I'm going to show you just a short bit of this now. Um, so this isn't subtitled. I've had to get these clips from various places. Um, but what you'll see is Kiristami interviewing a boy who said he's afraid to be alone with the filmmakers. Um, so the filmmakers have one of his friends join him in the room. But the boy still keeps asking to leave because he wants to return to his religion class in part to prove that he's done his homework. Um, and the scene ends as Kiristami asks him to recite a religious poem um, that's commonly taught in schools. ای خدا ای خدا ستاره های قشنگ ای خدا ای جوان رنگ و رنگ ای که را تو آوردی ما خوشید را تو آوردی نه همه و کو و تپا و دعیا نه بختارم با گل و سیبا بال سیبا برای پروانه از برای پرندگان لانه شادی و بازی و تبانایی چشم ما را برای بینایی برف و باران و گرمی و سردی همه را ای خدا تو آوردی Okay, so as I start to conclude, I want to think about this freeze frame. For this is exactly the same kind of shot with which Truffaut's The 400 Blows ends. You can see that here. But the device means something different in Kurosami's film. While Truffaut's freeze frame is a sympathetic expression of how Antoine, who has just escaped from reform school, has been trapped by the social institutions that were meant to help him, in homework's freeze frame, the boys are trapped not just by institutions like the school, but also by the filmmaking process itself, again, as a mode of social research. And this in turn implies that there is more to the boys than these research methods can ever reveal, um, which is something that Kiristami had just made clear a year earlier in his 1987 film, Where is the Friend's Home, um, which is a fiction film that's also about homework. Now, homework, like play, is likely unusual in how explicitly it engages with social scientific methods. But if these films are unusual, they're also important since both of them challenge the premises that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, not just the notion um, that social scientific research could help adults manage children's potentially dangerous encounter with a moving image, but also Brackage's idea of untutored vision. Indeed, the films offer a different genealogy via children for experimental film form, one that again is situated in a critique of social scientific methods. As such, the films indicate the generative role that children and the institutions devoted to studying them played for film aesthetics in the post-war years. This is similar to the role um, that research on children played in post-war film and media study. And indeed, um, ICF-CYP research reveals aspects of film studies disciplinary history that have largely been neglected, likely at once because of their focus on children, their applied and social scientific grounding, and their roots in places like East Germany, 
Yugoslavia and Iran, places that is outside of where film and media theory canon, the film and media theory canon finds its center of gravity. The network that produced this knowledge was finally, and I think as, as is, is clear here, fundamentally transnational, underscoring that children or ideas about children were also an impetus for the dissemination of media forms, theories, and institutional models during the Cold War, a period that's remembered more often and often incorrectly for its barriers to media circulation. This mobility had complex and often conflicting motivations, and it was underpinned by various internationalisms. It was enabled in part by UNESCO, whose liberalism undergirded a view that what the organization called films for the young should circulate freely without visas or taxes. And in part, it was enabled by what Lynn Spiegel describes as a common Cold War conception of children as, quote, representatives of an essential humanity that exists prior to civilization. End quote. But films like play and discussions like those held in East Berlin show something different. Children who were more modern than the adults studying them. Thank you. Thank you, Alice, for this wonderful talk. Uh, I'm hopeful we have questions from the audience as well as from Zoom. So please, if there's anyone who wants to jump in, I have questions, but I'm going to say them. You said something about a lecture regarding the hero in films in Czechoslovakia. Can you repeat what you said because I enjoyed that. Yeah, there was an ICF CYP, um, a UNESCO sponsored conference in 1967 in Czechoslovakia on the hero in children's films, which of course was a kind of um, torturous discussion of socialist realism and trying to figure out how. Um, how those what those conventions meant in 1967, specifically with regard to fairy tale films, um, and to the which were of course made very widely in East Germany and, and Czechoslovakia and elsewhere. So um, yeah, that that at Morin was there. Edgar Morin was there, so he had come from France to be part of that, and he had a you know speech at the conference, etc. Um, and this was a question that was really at the front of the minds of many of these institutions in Eastern Europe. Right? How do we think about this concept of the hero, and how do we rework it vis-a-vis um, -vis these questions about identification, about um, does it all need to be positive, et cetera. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Anyone else? In, now, in the 70s in Western Europe, mm -hmm. uh, there were several good examples of films mm, reflecting Nazism, fascism, authoritarianism, or through the eyes of uh, children. Mm. For instance, Amargor uh -huh. by Fellini yeah. in Italy. In Spain, we have a very good example: the Spirit of the B5. Yeah. Or you have the or you have the famous Gin Drum uh -huh. based on on uh, Untergras and Maeslo. Yeah. And and so it seems like it happened after two decades of silence about this. Yeah. You know? do, do you find something similar in Central and Eastern Europe in that moment as in, in a kind of reflection yeah. of hidden things yeah. through the, the eyes of the children or is uh, yeah. only examples in Western Europe? I don't think the only examples are, I mean, Ivan's Childhood by Tarkovsky, I think is like the first film that I think of in this regard. There's also Agia Republic, Agia Republic Along with the Republic um, by, who directed that? It's an adaptation, I know this because it's an army film. Um, it was made in 1965 in Czechoslovakia, a similar kind of um, really thinking about the end of World War II. So, but I think Spirit of the Beehive is such an interesting film. I teach that film um, because I find it, it's interesting because it's, it's rethinking the war, but it's also rethinking the war in the service of the fascist government, right? Because it was one of those um, films that was circulating quite widely in festivals. So I think it's an interesting question of what, how circulation comes into play here too. That's what interests me at least about these. And she was a girl as well. I mean, right. not, not just the boy. You know? Right, the, uh, exactly, right, which is very rare. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I don't work as much on fiction features, I will say, but I teach yeah. them. Um, and and so I think thinking about, you know, what does it mean for these films to be circulating is a big question that I'm asking in this project. And um, 
for Eastern Europe, some of the answer is, um, as, as was, I think, the case with Spirit of the Beehive, political legitimacy, right? A sort of sense of, well, these are festival films that are going to circulate widely, it will reflect well in us. Some of it has to do with hard currency for the Eastern European countries. This is a huge motivation. I mean, if you look at the largest number of film exports from Czechoslovakia, it is Kurtek, who people know, the little mole. Um, that, that is by far the film that's circulated. These, those films are circulated most widely. But they also, there are also these kinds of appeals to, again, universalisms, or in some cases, socialist internationalism. I think you sort of see that in um, the Radvani film. But yeah, it's a, it's a good question because um, the other part of what's happening in, fi in fiction features around this time is 68. And what we see happening in France with all this sort of discourse around cinema being in its adolescent phase and the cinema du papa and the reactions to that. So Eastern Europe has some of that. Um, I would say, especially in Poland um, and Czechoslovakia around um, the, you know, the, the Vida films, the, the, which is really are about adolescence, the, the Vida trilogy, and then the new wave films and the Czechoslovak context. But, but yeah, those are somewhat older, right? Youth as well as youth, not children. Thank you. Yeah, it's welcome. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering about, I've been wondering throughout the talk actually about how we, um, how you separate the perspective sort of the, through the child's eyes when it, that's actually just a kind of formalization of an adult perspective on childhood yeah. from what is actually through the child's eyes. Because in early, I mean, there's a lot of attention to uh, children's experience in fairly early cinema in in Eastern and Central Europe. And I, you know, I'm thinking of, of things for, you know, Alexander Ford's uh, Children Must Laugh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, Mir Kulmano is a, a Yiddish language film. What? That's 40, that's the war, that's a wartime that's film. That's a wartime right? film. Yeah, yeah. Um, or around it's a war era film. Yeah. Um, uh, and not, and not coincidentally, it's not the, it's not the last uh, Yiddish language feature film about children. Um, uh, but then, but those movies are all about the adult perspective, like the adult attempt to penetrate a child's perspective on the war, right? Which is a kind of losing proposition because adults don't have a child's perspective right. on the war. And then you go all that you mentioned uh, Ivana Vinyetsva, uh, Tarkovsky, and you can add a whole a lot of Tarkovsky is about a kind of obsessive added, uh, uh, attention to childhood experience. Uh, the mirrors, you know, right. does this yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but it's infused with nostalgia, which children do not have in regard right. to their own experience right. as children, right? right. right? right. right. Um, and it's, I was just thinking about this, even looking at the aesthetics of, um, of movies from the 60s and 70s, where it looks very much like something out of the children's television workshop, yeah. aesthetically. Yes. But it behaves nothing like that because the Children's Television Workshop, which those of you, I think most of you know, is the, what produces Sesame Street. And that was the first time that you really see in popular media what it would look like if children were given a camera, at least that I can think of. Yeah. So I'm wondering how you, how you, you know, when does that happen elsewhere in the in Eastern or Central Europe? When did children get the yeah. old cameras? Yeah. Well, the ICFCYP was sponsoring children's filmmaking activities. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that I, I would like to investigate further in Yugoslavia, because I, this is where um, Makabeyev's Nova Igrachka mm -hmm. was based, which we cannot be seen. He doesn't, he didn't want it to be seen. So it's a film that is, I don't, I, I know it exists, but I don't know, you know, how viewable it is, but uh, it was a film that was based on his work with children. So yeah, I would imagine, and this is really just speculation, that there were, um, I mean, I know in amateur film circles, there was a lot of this, right? There was amateur filmmaking clubs for children, et cetera, which were outside of these networks that I'm thinking of. And the children would be somewhat older in those cases too. Um, but Sesame Street is an interesting analog because it is, it's part of the story. And Heather Hendershot's written a wonderful book on this called Saturday Morning Censors that's about um, cognitive psychology and cognitive research and how that the rise of cognitive research gave birth to Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's kind of a, an offshoot of this. But yeah, the question of when a children's actual perspective comes into play is, um, would be an interesting one to track and an important one to track. And I think Yugoslavia offers a key here. Iran too, right? There, is, there are filmmaking workshops for children happening in that context. 
Um, you know, and I think that's where Brackage is so strange and interesting, right? Because that, that quote from 63 is, um, I think Scenes from Under Childhood is about a decade later. That's his, it might be 73, if anybody in the room knows. Um, but that's a film in which he's trying to approximate fetal vision, right? So it's it starts at least with that attempt of approximation. So it's kind of dark red and there's flashes of light. So um, experimental film takes this up in its own particular ways too. So yeah, I don't really have an answer to it, but it's a really great question. And I think your point about children not having nostalgia and, and how history comes into play here is really important. Yeah. So there's something we're sort of recuperative or there's something that is, you know, it, there's an adult political project that's mapped onto this very, very clearly. Right. Yeah. In the chat. Okay. Well, we've, we're already past the hour, but if there are further thoughts or questions. Can I, can I ask you to actually just to give us a, a, a short spiel about uh, Kodak? Sure, yes. Because uh, it's so fascinating. Yeah, yes. So in my other, um, this is a project I've been working on for quite a while, but I interrupted it when I um, started working on this history of film stock. So um, this is a project called Militant Chemistry, Film and Its Raw Materials. And it looks at um, the intertwining between film manufacturing, the making of celluloid and the chemical industry. Um, so it's rooted primarily in Kodak's um, subsidiary in Tennessee, Tennessee Eastman, now known as Eastman Chemical, which started off making um, raw materials for Kodak's films, especially its non-flammable cellulose acetate films. But um, as a virtue of its work in that area, ended up developing um, work in chemical engineering that, that allowed her to become a Manhattan product project contractor. So that's at the core of the story, but it's works between um, Tennessee and uh, Agfa's film factory in Wolfen, um, which is in the East German chemical triangle. So not far from the Czechoslovak border. Um, and it thinks through the sourcing of raw materials from colonial and non-colonial contexts um, about notably uranium, right? Which was the, the material that um, was at the core of Kodak's work, the Manhattan Project, and then thinks about what happened after the war um, when um, representatives of US film companies, including Kodak, went to investigate both in the Alpha Wolfen factory, um, um, as did the Soviets at the same time, trying to sort of take um, spoils of war from, from the factory and uh, to develop color film technologies, or in the Soviet case, to bring them to Shoska, Ukraine, where they established um, their film factory number three on the basis of the expropriated um, East German factory. So it's really thinking about the technopolitics of film stock. That's a kind of a detailed outline of the project mm -hmm. um, through the chemistry involved in, in film manufacturing. So yes. Fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. And is the digital era changing your field in the relationship between uh, cinema and the media and education in the schools as well? Does the digital era, era change this? Well, I think from the perspective of this project on Filmstock, one of the things that is interesting about the digital era is that while we tend to see film as dead, right, we don't use it anymore. In fact, it's it's caused a sort of upswing. There are certain, um, there's been this revival in analog photography that's both still in, in moving image, but also um, the, there, like Tom Cruise, for instance, I mean, allegedly will not be shot on anything but 35 millimeter Kodak film. So there is a certain, yeah, there are certain, uh, there are certain parts of this that are very much alive. And I think what's interesting about it is that this is a story that maps onto other histories and media that certain, many, many people are studying right now about rare earths and our cell phones and about the supply chains that link our, you know, media objects and media processes and technologies to um, various forms of violence. And I think maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think sometimes we tend to think of the cinema era as kind of the innocent era, right? The celluloid era, but I think there, there are always complicated um, political histories embedded in these objects. So yeah, so it's it's an attempt to think about this and to think about it through the sort of triangulation of, of spaces across the Atlantic um, from one another and the movement of materials as well. Yeah. Well, thank you all for the great questions. Well, this is, yeah. Thank you, Alice. We, I, I think we should we can end on this the note of Alice's perhaps um, inadvertent pun where she said that uh, uranium was at the core yes. of Kodak's yes. work on the Manhattan it Project. Was, I think that's great. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, please uh, one more round of applause for our guests.